morning. The reason why they want you to complete the series is so that when you have this, it doesn't go gap, gas, it rasp. <laughs> so, so hopefully you can really house your grasp. It's not house your gas. How's your gap? <laughs> so hopefully we complete the entire series. We're um, celebrating our 27th year anniversary. So maybe we can start by doing this. Again, can we just all stand up? Yes, let's give a big hand to our God and to one another. And say to that person beside you, happy anniversary. Yes. All those in the Samutsari and the different uh, on-sites, can you just do that? Yes. Take your seats. We are celebrating today, uh, this year, not with a Sunday, but a series. We're not celebrating it with just one topic, but with a series. And we have chosen a kind of different um, series today. We have chosen the series with How is Your Grasp? And you might be wondering, ano ba ibig sabihin nun? What, what am I supposed to be grasping? And... Um, it's basically GRASP is an acronym that stands for the fundamentals of being a member of Pinnacle Village. So it's going to be a little bit different because oftentimes when we come here, we come here talking about practical, practical things of the faith. But for this anniversary, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. We're, talking, we're going to talk about who we are as a church because we are what we are, because a lot of people that have gone ahead of us had a good grasp. And if we want this church to continue to become stronger and deeper in the faith, not just for us, but for the next generation, we have to make sure that the grasp remains strong. So the question for us, Pinnacle Village, is how is the grasp of people who say this is their church, of people who claim that this is their spiritual family? Who, the, for the people that say, I love Pinnacle Village, I enjoy Pinnacle Village. The question is, do we have people that are fighting for it? Do we have people that makes making sure that it will continue strong and that the next generations will enjoy what we are enjoying now as a church family? Well, if they're saying, yeah, I want that. Yes, that's something that I like for this church. Then the huge question for all of us is this. How is your church grasp? How is my grasp? Not my gas, not my gap, not my rasp. So can you look at the person beside you and can you say to that person, take care, hold this and say, take care of your grass. <laughs> so for today, we will be handling the letter G, which is basically committing to a growth group. Commitment to a growth group. And it's a very important topic. I'll bring in an introduction for the series in the letter G. Next week is very important, not just because it's letter R, which basically stands for reaching out to others that are not yet in Christ. How's my reaching out to others that's not yet in Christ? But it's important because the first one that did a reach out beyond his comfort zone is our Messiah and Lord Jesus Christ. When he left the heavenly abode to be with us, to take the form of man, the limitation of being a man, just to become one of us so that he can die for us, reach out to us, understand our human frame, so that eventually he can be our Lord. And as he has reached out to us and has pursued us, we're supposed to reach out to others too. And that's the reason why next week is very important. Sometimes people feel very religious when it's Easter. Agree? And a lot of people, you know, you know they can't, that's the time when people come to church. So I guess what I'm saying is, maybe we can take advantage of that. And next week, because it's Easter, and it's letter R, we're going to talk about how God reached out to us. You might want to consider bringing another person to church, to Pinnacle Village, and say, hey, it's Easter. You might want to come. You might want to join us. So again... We will do a lot of this, okay? Look at that person beside, of, beside you. Can you say to that person, bring someone next week? Can you say that? <laughs> oh, but I won't be there. Oh, it will be gasp. You don't want, how's your gasp? So, so that's very important for us. 
Now, there's a man by the name of John, Johnny Cash. An American singer, songwriter, guitarist, actor, and author. One of the best-selling music artists of all time. Have sold more than 90 million records worldwide. Show business pressures soon drove him to the pep pills. He became addicted to amphetamine. His first arrest came in 1965, and he was caught with more than 1,000 pills in his pocket. From 200 pounds, he went down to 140 pounds in weight. Side effects from drugs caused him a severe car accident. He broke his nose, knocked out four teeth. He was going steadily downhill. Record shows that this man had more lives than 10 cats because he wrecked every car he had for seven years. He totaled two Jeeps and a camper, turned over two tractors and a bulldozer, sank two boats in separate accidents on a lake. Di ba matay matay? Jumped from a truck just before it went over a 600-foot cliff in California, brawled and incurred permanent scars, and drove himself into a wild frenzy many times with drugs. Yet when the raging voice quieted, there was always the still small voice whispering, I am your God. I love you. I am the one that you're looking for. Johnny Cash said, the hand of God was never off me. In all of my wanderings, I could never escape the hound of heaven, which pursued me from my childhood. And I guess this is something that we all now look back, retro, retro look and say, yeah, I felt that. The hound of heaven just continually pursuing me. I see Hernan, he was sharing to me the fact that he came to the faith one day when eventually someone said to him, I'd like to share with you a gift that God has given us. And the gospel was shared to him, a very clear understanding of why the Lord reached out to us, which we will understand next week on Easter. And as he embraced that and accepted that gift of God, it was his birthday. <laughs> How personal can God be? And we see this many times in our own stories. But, you know, I just would like us to understand this. God did not save us just for that. God saved us because he wants us to be his sons. He didn't redeem us, period. He redeemed us so that he could relate with us. Our God did not only want to be a forgiver of mankind. He wants to be the father of mankind. There is one thing amazing about God when you read the Bible. He is in a pursuit of a relationship with you and me. And when we understand this, we become like that psalmist, if you remember. The psalmist would say, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. We're here now and gone tomorrow. We're like a flower that blossoms today and tomorrow withers away. And yet you give us this such great, amazing, unconditional love, grace that is new every morning. And you wonder... Why give us the begotten Son? Why? Because for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And friends, this is what the Lord intended us to have. Galatians chapter 4 verse 6 summarizes it this way. Listen to this. But when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, listen to this, to redeem us. Why? that we might receive an adoption to sonship. Because you are now his sons, there is a sealing, there is a legally binding thing that happened. God sent the spirit of Jesus Christ, of his son, into our hearts. And that spirit inside us 
just confirms, gives us the confidence, just allows us to feel, anak ka. And by which you are able to say, Daddy, Papa, the God who created the heavens and earth, the God that is there eternally, no beginning and no end, stoop down to just uplift and honor man so that that man would be able to say, Abba, Father. Now watch this. Since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Now this is one of the many metaphors in the Bible about how we are now related to God once we receive what God has done through Jesus Christ on the cross, which we will see next week. He is our king, and therefore we are his subjects. We are to submit to him. He is the vine, we are the branches, and therefore we are to always remain, stay connected with him. He is the master, we are his servants, and therefore am I serving him? He is the potter, we are the clay. Am I moldable? To what, Lord? What are you molding me after? He is the shepherd. We are the sheep. And Lord, do I hear your voice? And do I follow the voice as your sheep? And this is the reason why to, be come, to come to the faith is just the start. It is not the end of it all. It's not everything. It's the beginning of something bigger. And that's the reason why in the Bible, when, we, when Jesus was about to leave planet Earth, he did not tell his followers, go and make Christians or make converts or make believers out of the world. He said, make disciples. Because disciple means learner, apprentice, student, pupil, learner, follower. The word Christian only appears three times in the Bible. The word believer only appears twice in the Bible. The word disciple appeared 269 times. I guess what I'm saying is, the question for us is not whether I am a Christian, I'm a believer. That's the start. That's not everything that the Lord meant you to have when He sent His Son to die on the cross. Because He did not want you to just be redeemed. He wants you to relate with Him. To grow in your relationship with Him. It's something like this. When you enter a new reality, you need to adapt to that new reality. When you become a student, you attend an orientation given by that university or that school. When you come to America, we have to eventually acclimatize to America. And when you get married or enter into a relationship, there's what you call a time of adjustment. And that's the same way. You're my king. How, what do you want me to subject to, king? I'm, I'm your son, so how do, how do I relate with you? I don't know how many of you watched Blindside. Would you remember that movie? A beautiful movie. And I reviewed it because I just wanted to understand this even more. Adoption. That's where um, um, there was this 16-year-old boy, homeless, that was adopted by a Christian family. And when he got adopted by this Christian family, everything changed. He had to learn new ways. He had to learn the ethos of the family. Where do they eat? Where do they, where do they go on a Sunday? What do they do on a regular day? Um, what do they believe in? Um, what is it to be a member of this family? What are my roles as a son? What are my rights, my responsibilities? And therefore, it is important for us to be a disciple. That's, for example, adoption. You see, when Paul said, we are an adopted son, and we see this over and over again in the Bible, everywhere we see this, that we're adopted. What did Paul mean? What was he really trying to say? When he said, for example, in Romans chapter 8, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that you are God's children. And if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I don't even say not. That's very deep. You know why? Because the Jews have no understanding of adoption. Because when you lose your dad and you become an orphan, you are now a responsibility of his sibling. Your uncle 
takes the role of being a father to you and takes care of you, his nephew, his niece. There is no adoption among the Jews. So when he was saying we are adopted children, he was looking at it in the context of the Roman culture. Because in Rome, listen to this, a father biologically of a son can forsake his son because he did not decide or choose that son. He did not desire that son. It is more binding if you are an adopted one. Why? Because you decide that one. You chose that one. An adopted child receives a new identity. Any prior commitment, responsibilities, and debts were erased. New right identity and responsibilities were taken on. In ancient Rome, the concept of inheritance, listen to this, is not like we understand now. When my parents die, I get my inheritance. When the Lord said, you are now co-heirs with Christ, and you'd see this every time, every time adoption is mentioned, you're also said to have been a co-heir of Christ. Now, in the context of ancient Rome, the concept of inheritance was part of earthly life, not something that began at the death of the parents. Being adopted made someone an heir to their father, joint sharers in all his possessions and fully united to him while the father is still alive. And look at the person beside you. Okay, sabi ko na sa inyo. Tingnan mo sa, sabihin mo nga sa kanya, ang yaman mo naman pala. You're rich. You know, when we understand this, we come to really say, Who am I, O Lord, that you take such notice of me? We now really say, like Psalm chapter 8, again and again, When I consider what you've done, the heavens, the moons and the stars, Who am I that you just take so much notice of me? This is our God. In fact, if you continue on Romans chapter 8, it says this, If you understand this love, it is binding. Listen to this. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 38. Because of this love, because of this relationship that you have as a son in Christ, bound with love. Look at what Romans chapter 8, 38 says. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor either height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Imagine that. But friends, the question is, how much of that do I understand? And that's why Paul in Ephesians was praying after he talked about this good greatness of God. Ephesians is the book that will make us understand church. And as after he just talked about how the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit connived to give us our new identity. He stopped and he prayed and he said, I pray that the eyes of your heart that that heart had, that have eyes might really see and understand the riches of your calling, of the inheritance you have as His people. The question that we have to ask is, how much of it do I actually experience? Are we here? Are we following this? This is the reason why discipleship, to take the position of, I am a learner of the things of God. I'm a student of the ways of the Lord. I want to understand the Bible. My, my highlight yesterday, beautiful anchored yesterday, but my highlight was when I left this room and when I went out, there was a father who came to me showing me his Bible and his new stuff, and he said, this year, I want to finish this book. The question that we have to ask ourselves, I've been a Christian for many years. But when was the last time you went through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Is that your manual? How many of us can say, I know what Philippians is or the book of Romans is. I know what the Bible says about finances and I'm following that. I know what the Bible says about marriage and as a husband or a wife, I know what that means. I know what it is to be a part of a body of Christ. And this is, what, this is what the Bible says about anger. This is what the Bible, you know, a learner of the way. And I guess this is why Dallas Willard said this. Listen to this. Lean in. It's a little bit heavy and a little bit long, but very important for us to understand as we celebrate our anniversary. Happy anniversary. Let's read this. 
And there's a great deal of disappointment expressed today about the character and the effects of Christian people. Dallas Willard. Most of the disappointment comes from Christians themselves who find that what they profess just isn't working. Not for themselves, nor so far as they can see for those around them. There's a great disappointment. Because of a great disparity, there is an obvious great disparity between, on the one hand, the fullness of life expressed in Jesus, found real in the Bible and many shining examples from among his followers, and on the other hand, the actual day-to-day -day behavior, inner life, and social presence of most of those who now profess adherence to him. So you put it in the Bible, ito dapat eh. Bible, these are the examples and this is how the fullness of life is. But when I look at us now in our everyday living, there's a great disparity. There are things that I know I should be, but I'm, there's a great disappointment. It's not happening. And I don't know how many of us sometimes feel that. Or sometimes, you know, that person claims to be a follower of Christ, but then I look at it, parang, um, mm, I don't know. It's like Mahatma Gandhi. I like their Jesus, but I cannot understand his followers. And Dallas Willard said, continuing, it's non-discipleship that robs us of abiding peace, a life penetrated throughout by love, faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding governance for good, hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging of circumstances, power to do what is right and withstand the forces of evil. In short, non-discipleship causes us exactly the abundance of life Jesus said he came to bring. A few Sundays ago, there's a woman that came and visited us. She's a daughter of one of the TV personalities back home in the Philippines. She told me her story in the office, and she was just telling me that she was young when she came to the faith. She, was, she had this four spiritual laws track. I don't know if you know what you're, I'm talking about. Some of you perhaps know. But that track talked about how to get into a relationship with God. And she said she would read it on her way to school and, back, back, and her way back home. And she would find herself sometimes in tears reciting that prayer. But you see, there was a problem. There was none that followed up on her, mentored her, discipled her, and she found herself eventually leaving the faith. She even became suicidal. She became, she became came wasted. She made a lot of wrong decisions and found herself at the bottom of life. Until one day, there was a pastor's wife that took notice of her, took her in, mentored her, taught her how to meditate on the Bible, taught her about her new identity and the riches of the inheritance of a co-heir of Jesus Christ, started to teach her how to walk with the spirit that is inside him that shouts to God, Abba, Father. And as she gets mentored, she found herself finding sense of clarity. She said, one step at a time. When I'd read the Bible, I would always read with anticipation that there's something there for me. To get me through for just one day. And I would step out in faith. Not knowing anything, I'll just obey the scriptures as it has been revealed to me for that day. And I found myself getting out of that deep, deep valley that I found myself in, that I got myself in. One step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. It reminds me of the book of Proverbs when it says, the life of a righteous man is like the light of the dawn that shines brighter and brighter into a new day. From a one who had a very ugly marriage, some of you, if I tell you the name, you would know how deep the valley that he got himself into, how he got herself out of that, how she found herself here. And she told me a few, a few weeks ago, there was an opening that was given to me, but I didn't want to shake my comfort zone because it meant I have to study new things. It meant I have to have to adjust once again 
this so well controlled balanced life where i have time for my family my daughter my my husband with work everything it's all ironed out for me and it will be disturbed and it means entering into an unknown it means starting once again from the start from the bottom and rising up again because it's a new thing but every time she'd pray she said there was there was this i just sense the Lord wanted me to take it. You will never graduate from that, being a disciple. And she said, I need to obey. She's a disciple. And she, she stepped out, and she took the challenge. Guess what? A few days afterwards, the husband comes home with the news. He got laid off. As she was talking about this, she was just weeping and weeping. She said, the story of my life. I found my heart moved because this is what life is meant to be. She's a disciple. And friends, Dallas Willard said, what the church really needs now is the quality of life God intended for them to experience that only happens when they choose to be his disciples. So the greatest issue is whether those who are identified as Christians will become disciples. Students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of heaven in every corner, every area, work, school, Family, neighborhood, church, every corner of human existence. There is eternity in every person's home, every person's heart. And nothing that is not eternal and nothing of the finite thing, no matter how huge and pleasurable, will ever satisfy us. And yet this emptiness is being, being filled being tried to be satisfied by the things that are tentative, and yet it leaves us empty, for they are fulfilling and pleasurable only for a moment. To summarize everything this world can offer us is just one word, and it is this, tentative. It's temporary. But when we become a disciple, the deepest need of man, though sometimes the external needs are not satisfied, is met. The way to put it is Matthew chapter 11. Jesus was talking to disciples and in verse 28 he said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and you are burdened. And he said, I'll be the one to give you rest. And what kind of rest is he talking about? Physical rest? Take my yoke, my teachings, my learnings. Learn from me. Be the disciple. Not just be a believer of mine, but somebody who wants to study and learn my ways. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And when you do this, I like this, you will find rest for your souls. So a lot of people are tired, lonely, bored, depressed, anxious, afraid. All of this are of the soul. And anyone who has so many things going around externally, so many things are happening, they are just increasing, going up, ascending in their careers and all. But if the soul, which is the permanent one, which is who we really are, is not satisfied, there is tiredness. In other words, it's not what we're doing or what's happening on the outside. It's what's happening inside. Can you look, sorry, can you look at the person beside you and can you say to that person, the world inside you is more important than the world around you. And so the commandment in Matthew chapter 28 was this. Are you with me? Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. See, the word baptizing here actually means when you are baptized in the name of someone, you are being immersed, identified, 
you are now being connected with that person. So the question really is, I remember one person telling me, I will be, guess where I was baptized? I was baptized in the Jordan River. But you see, that's not an issue. Where you were baptized? Guess when I was baptized? It was winter time. It, the lake was cold, freezing. It was ice cold. It's not when you were It's uh, The question is, in whose name? And so Jesus was saying, in the identity, in the purpose, in the cause, in the mission, in the very being of Jesus, the Father in the Spirit, baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. And teaching them, or teach them. It did not say, and teach them everything I commanded you. It did not say that. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The secret is not just to listen. The secret is not just to hear. The secret is, Lord, am I in the obedience? There's the scripture in James chapter 1. Are you still with me? In James chapter 1, James is the epistle for growth. And in James chapter 1, James was saying, I don't know why in Tagalog it's Santiago, but Santiago is actually James. And it says this in verse 22, hey, do not merely listen to the word. Everybody's doing that now. And deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Because anyone who listens to the word and who does not do what it says, it's like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Meaning to say, like for example, when you are, for example, in a department store and you want to purchase or buy a shirt or a blouse or a dress, right? Once you've chosen your dress, where do you go? To the fitting room. And you want to make sure that that fitting room has a what? A mirror, right? With the intention of seeing your reflection and seeing how do I look. Because if you get out there and you saw that you look, that the shirt is too tight, bukakang suman, and you forget about that, you might purchase that, right? But if you find out, oh, I, it's too tight, I need to get one size bigger. Or it's too loose, mukha kang hanger, you know? You don't buy it, but get something that is one size smaller, right? So you, you don't say, this mirror is so nice, or this preaching was so beautiful, or my gosh, this series, I love it, I love it. No, no, no. The question is, um, did you see a reflection of yourself and adjust it accordingly, right? Because when we look at the mirror, it is with the intention of wanting to see, am I a disciple? Am I in line? Because if my words abide in you, ask whatever it, it would, uh, you ask. Ask, uh, no, uh, ask <laughs> whatever you want in my name, and it shall be given to you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. And prove that you are my disciple. Because you're abiding. You're learning. Are we getting this? And that's the reason why it says this. Verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law. Intently means focus. You really take down notes. I didn't catch that. I will ask the speaker about that. Um, I will review it. I know this is in YouTube. I really want to understand this with an intention to learn. Like, for example, in my batch, high school batch, there is this one thing that everybody wants to learn. It's how to bake sans rival. People are taking down notes. Ilan? One, one cup? Ah, uh -uh, one half cup. Very detailed. Because everybody wants to do it in perfection. One who wants to be a disciple really is there. He wants to understand. He wants to really get the instruction because he wants to do it. And it says this, and, and it says this, and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. I remember what Charles Spurgeon said. Charles Spurgeon said, I fear we have many in congregations admiring and, in, and inspired by the hearers who remain unblessed because they do not do the word of God. They're not doers of the word of God. It said this, not forgetting what they heard, but by doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. 
we're only blessed when we do it. Remember when we did the love challenge, a lot of people were telling me, GBA, bakit love challenge na naman? Take up na natin yung last year eh. And I tell them, it's not what you've heard, it's how much of what you've heard you've done. Alam ko na yan, but it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know. It's not the knowledge of it. It's applying, <coughs> nasa bituloy ako, iniisip niyo ako, applying the knowledge that you've heard. I've heard this series already. Lord, why are they doing it again? Why are we taking it up again? Speak to the pastors of Pinnacle Village. Enough of this. I've known this. But maybe the reason why the Lord wants you to hear it again is not because you have no knowledge of it, but because we have not practiced it. Blessed are they who are not hearers, but doers. But friends, can I have your ears? Because I think you will agree with me. It's not easy to be a follower of Christ. Agree? How many of you say, agree? Can I see your hands? How many? Kayang kaya, walang problema. It's hard, right? And I guess this is the reason why when the Lord called us as Christians, He did not only call us to be His own, He also called us to be part of those that He owns, His people, His church. When He called us individually to Himself, he called us corporately to each other. Look at that person beside you. Can you say to that person, you have been called to be part of my life. Can you say to that person, I was called by God. Say it with conviction. I was called by God to be a part of your life. Where's that? Ephesians chapter 2. Listen to this, everyone. Ephesians 2 verse 19. Now you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven, but you are members of God's very own family. When God became your father, you know, you became our sibling in the faith. We became siblings of one another. You are now members of God's very own family citizens of God's kingdom. When he became our king, we became fellow citizens in his kingdom. Then it continues on. And you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Ephesians 2 verse 21 and following, we who believe, we are now carefully joined together. We're being joined together as parts of, I like this, a constantly growing. It's a temple that's alive. It's alive. It's growing for God. And you also are joined with Him. Jesus is the cornerstone, the foundation rock. With each of us, First Peter 2 calls us living stones, living blocks that are being put together. And eat with each other by the Spirit. And we are part of this temple, this dwelling place of God. When we come together, the presence of the Lord comes down. I don't know if you've experienced that. I guess you have. There are many times when we experience this while we're praying or we're, even now when we, when we talk, when we listen to the Word, sometimes we sense God is speaking to us. And because we're a temple. He said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there in your, your midst. United Nations does not have that. G8, G10, G12, G20. No, the great nations of the world, they don't have that. That's ours. Presence of God comes when two, just two or three. But look at us. In fact, Psalm 22 verse 3 says, God inhabits the praises of his people. And can I just say this? I like this. Second John 1 verse 12. I have so much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Or let's just say, I don't want to zoom. I don't want to text and chat. Instead, I hope to visit Pinnacle Village. I hope to be there at the huddle on site and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. My friends, the reason why we are coming together is because you can't do it on your own. To be a follower of Christ, it's becoming more and more difficult as day go by, as days go by. And I guess that's the reason why during the time, the early Christians, 
They have huge gatherings in the temple, but they also have small gatherings at home. People gather in homes for growth groups, which we now call huddle. Like 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19, it says, Greet Aquila and Priscilla. Those were the huddle guides. And the church that meets in their house. Like Colossians 4, verse 15, Greet Nympha. And the church that meets in her house. Their huddle guide is Nympha. You see, circles are better than rows. And I don't want to go deep into this letter G, being committed to a growth group, which we call a huddle. Because we've been talking about this over and over again. That's the reason why every time, every Sunday, we have an invite for us to come, join small groups, take the next step. Why? Because here, you all face front. You're all facing me. But in a huddle, in circles, you face one another. Aleon, in Greek, one another. Happens more regularly in a huddle. That's why we're supposed to be gathering together in huddles. That's around 59 times mentioned each other. Love one another, encourage each other, honor one another. You see this everywhere, 59 times. And you can't do that here. It's more effective in small groups. And that's why it said we have to make sure that we are in small groups. It's getting more difficult. Timothy Keller one time said, we are entering a new era in which there is not only no social benefit to being a Christian, but in fact, if you're a Christian, there's an actual social cost. The environment, the society is no longer, you know, favorable to Christians. In many places, culture is becoming increasingly hostile toward faith and beliefs in God, truth, sin, and the afterlife are disappearing in more and more people. Now the culture is producing people for whom Christianity is not only offensive, it's incomprehensible. That's why we're asking people to gather in small groups. Not only to gather, not only to join, but to commit. What does that mean? When your huddle guide texts you, you text back. That's what it means. Some of you are smiling. Most probably you're a huddle guide. What does that mean? Attend regularly. Because Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, Let us not be in the habit of forsaking the assembling together of the saints as the days draw near so that we can encourage one another. What does that mean? Be a student. Listen well on a Sunday. Study the assignments. Answer the questions in your mind so that discussions can be so more spontaneous. What does that mean? When you are in the huddle, be present there. Join the discussion with the intention of helping disciple one another by your experiences that you share. Small groups, very, very important. I don't want to go deep with this one because we've talked so much about this in the past. But I like what one person said. Life without deep relationships will be a simpler life. It will. You know, how many of you say, sometimes talking to people can be draining. Hindi, sa totoo lang. Can I see your hands? Oh, diba? Bilis ng kamay. Diba? You have to smile. Even though you lost, already, you, you lost the conversation already because your mind is somewhere. Diba? You know, you... You have to nod your head, affirming, pero sa totoo lang, gusto mo nang magsalita because you're disagreeing with what he's saying. Di ba? Sometimes it's long and repetitious and long winding and he says, why don't you just, you know, go to the bottom of this and, and yet you have to be patient, be a Christian, smile. And sometimes you get drained. But friends, life without deep relationship will be a simpler life. But Tom Holiday said this, but it's also an empty life. I'd like to add, but it's also a shallow life. It's also a weak life. Because lives are stronger when connections are deeper. You know why it's easy to miss a huddle? Because if you miss one, you don't feel it. And because if you attend one, you don't see the benefit of it. But if you miss it many times, collectively, it's becoming a habit. It's becoming easier the second time around. 
you find yourself in a disastrous situation eventually. And if you keep on attending regularly, you find yourself in deeper relationships. Ecclesiastes, pity a man who falls and there's no one that lifts him up. Because two are stronger when they to come together. They produce better labor when they're together. And I don't know how many of you have seen people that are broken in their relationships with their husband or their wife or with their children or when a family goes through a crisis. And there's no one to help them out. Now, Ecclesiastes says, pity the man who enters into a time when there is a crisis in the family, whether that be health, finances, or something. And there's no one to pick them up. You see, deep relationships are not developed, you know, overnight. It takes time to develop deep relationship. Hindi ka po pwedeng nasa emergency room. In the emergency room natin ang ating relationships. That's why I've seen people that were broken by problems, but they don't remain broken because there is a huddle that has developed in relationships with them for the longer time. And that's the reason why it's so important that we come together. It's so hard to be a disciple now. But I'd like to say this too. The reason why we're going through this entire series is because it's not just enough to come together as a group in our huddles. We need to also do letter R, letter A, letter S, letter P, the RASP side, where we are serving one another, letter S, where we're praying for the church, letter P, where we are supporting one another, where we are actually sharing our abilities for the service of God. All of this are being put together. And I would like us to attend this entire series. You see, there's a scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 4 that says this. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function. Again, look at that person beside you. And can you say, can you say that person, you have a special function. Now look at this. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body. Listen to this. And we all belong to each other. We all belong to each other. Like a body, everyone has a part. Now look at Ephesians chapter 4. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. Last. Once again, look at that person beside you. Can you say to that person, you have a special work to do. Can you say this? And when you do it, you help me grow. I'll read it again, verse 16. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body, the entire village is healthy. The entire village is growing. The entire village is full of love. Friends, can I have your ears? We are what we are today because we have pioneers that have invested time, talent, treasure, energy into this place. When we were beginning, when we purchased this property, you know, when you come here, for example, every Saturday, this place is buzzing with energy. People out there cleaning, renovating, doing plumbing, Doing electricals, cleaning up the place, preparing every Sunday. Some of them have been with us for many years. From the beginning when we were pioneering this work. Every Saturday you come here and you get to see people practicing, preparing all these things that we see. Every Sunday, a lot of people are here way ahead of us that are gathered here. They come and we hold hands and we pray. The patio is being prepared. The marshals is being prepared. The children's ministry is being prepared. The city lights prepare. Everyone in operation. And that's why we enjoy this. The reason why we have what we have is because this church is 95% run by volunteers. And friends, we enjoy the fruits of their labor. When we come here, we enjoy it. But can we have this for a longer time, for the next generation can we continue to enjoy this amidst the voices that we hear from the outside? Amidst what we see and listen to from the culture that is lingering around us? Friends, the answer to that is this. How many of us would say, 
grasp my abilities for the service of God, my support for the work, my prayer for the church. We are not complete until those that say, this is my church, would also give back to the church, pass forward that they have, what they have experienced. And that means take one or two Sundays and volunteer at the city lights. Take one or two Sundays and be the one to take care of the children. Because every Sunday, somebody's taking care of your children. Once in a while, once a month, go come here on a Saturday and help. Help clean up this entire place. Because we are not a white church. We cannot afford employment the way that the white churches do. What we have achieved as primarily Filipinos, and many of us have reached out to the other races and we welcome all the other races, is something that we are thankful for because it's only by the grace of God. But as we th thank those that pioneered and became disciples of Christ, let's also find ourselves saying, I too will do that for the future of this work. And for this anniversary, we're calling people to lean in and just do exactly that. May every one of us say, my grasp is good. When you're asked, how is your grasp? In Matthew chapter 6, we are asked, what are we investing our time, talent, treasure on, our energy on? In Matthew chapter 6, we're being asked, what are you storing up? What are you rich in? In Matthew 6 says this, verse 19, listen to this. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. But store up for yourselves, verse 20, treasures in heaven. Why? Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Verse 24, for no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I know that we mean this well. We work hard to secure a future for our family. But please, not at the expense of the foundation of the life of our children. For they will be rich externally, but empty internally. They will be tired in their souls. We need the church, but we need people to invest time, talent, energy, treasure. That's what grasp is all about. The culprit is sometimes we worry. In verse 31 of Matthew 6, do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. Because those that don't know me, the pagans, they run after these things. But what makes us different from them is we have a heavenly father that knows what we need. So this is what we're supposed to do. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. And all these things that you are working for will be added unto you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For that's the culprit. By faith, give it to God. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's a Silicon Valley guy. So busy, so important, so successful. First one inside the office building. Last one out of the office building. There's just so much to do always. His wife was starting to complain because he's starting to miss out on the lives of the children that are fast growing up. The children were starting to complain about the fact that he was not there to read storybooks for them in the night. He was no longer attending their games or their, their, their recitals or their plays, their school programs. He was absent as they were growing up. He felt guilty about it because he was, they were not like that in the beginning. But things started to get out of hand. I can have years for a moment. You see, Health was compromised. You see, faith was compromised. He was no longer leading the people, his family to church the way that he did when they were start, starting as a family. But as they became settled and more established, he has forgotten the God that helped them to be established and settled. And he started to live his life on his own. But life caught up with him. One day he got sick eventually passed away. And when that happened, everybody was asking, how much was he worth? What did he leave behind? A wise man who overheard this said, 
Oh, he left everything the way everyone will. You see, there's a parable about this in Luke chapter 12. Jesus was saying about, talking about the parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest, so he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barn and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, retire well. You have your 40, 401k, okay. You have your SS so secured. You will have plenty of grain laid down for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. No, he's not a wicked man. No, he's not an evil man. Just in God's eyes, you fool. Mang mang, hindi mo naiintindihan. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And it ended this way. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. I talk to us today because the reason sometimes that we are not able to invest in the things of God is because of work, of career. And that's a, you know, that was with good, that's with good intention. But friends, do understand, we're not here to stay. There are more important things than the externals. We have to be rich toward God. In fact, in God, Mark 9 said, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, simply because you belong to Christ, I surely I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Every deed that we do for God and his people is accountable, accounted for. I ask you, what are your talents and abilities for? Is that to serve your own life here on earth, which is temporary, for you're not meant here to stay? Or is it meant to build the church, his people, where people find meaning, faith, hope, growth in the things of the souls, so that people will rest as they continue on in life? What are we rich, rich in? What are we investing our time, energy, abilities, talent, treasure in? I'll end with this. There's a woman by the name of Lola Uping. She eventually passed away at the age of 97 years old. She's the great-grandmother of a clan of four generations of people in the faith. She's the Lola of Kuya Jojo Adriano, the great-grandmother of the likes of Arden, Demi, and that generation of kids in San Francisco. She passed away, and they had a celebration of life. No, in the eyes of the world, she may not be as rich as the others. But does it really matter? For she is now in eternity. Amber was talking about her today in the powerhouse. And Amber said, when I listened to him and I saw what, everything that was happening, she said, I said to myself, if I'm going to live up to 97 years old, I want to die that way. Because she said, when there was this celebration of life, listen to this. People were sad because they were separated from this woman of love of faith that have passed on something that is essential to their existence, a relationship with God. Could I have your ears? But they were so happy too. They were celebrating because she is now in eternity. Hindi mo marandaman yung lungkot. Sobrang lakas ng pananampalatayang napasa sa kanila. It brought in a deeper meaning for existence, a deeper anticipation. So though they missed her, there's also this great desire to serve God even more, to better the life here even more, and to live for the cause that really matters. You know, when I was listening to this, at the back of my mind, I was saying, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Oh, death, 
where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Tagalog, kamatayan, nasa ng iyong katagumpay. Kamatayan, nasa ng iyong kamandag. Suddenly, the greatest fear that man has had no power. No matter how brave a person is, he faces the fact that he's mortal. And when we reach that end, we start to really realize what is important. Don't, don't do that. That when you're about to retire, that's when you say, I start, start, have to start thinking of things that are essential to life. Serve God at the prime of your life, not when you're 50, 60, 70. Invest on the things of eternity. Why? Because where your heart is, where your treasure is, your investment is, that's where your heart is. We are praying that we do not only grow in our love for one another, but in our faith in God. That we as a church what not, will not only grow in our relationship with each other, but that we as a church would grow in our relationship with Him. That here, you don't only have friends that you grow deep in relationship with, but here, you also get to know God and you grow deep in your relationship with Him. Church, let's celebrate this year by asking one question. What is your grasp? How is it? And may we find ourselves saying, this year, I would like to prioritize something that sometimes it's easy to, be, to shelve or to put in the back seat. I want to prioritize, Lord, my relationship with you. Sometimes we easily get contented. I, we learn a little about this, we improve a little on this area, and we just stop and say, okay, na yan. But let there be a hunger that Paul had when he said, I have not yet attained to it. So one thing I do, I press on toward the goal. I press forward. I want more. And you know what? When Paul was saying that, he was an old man. He was the prominent figure of the early church. He was the guy that had written a lot of the epistles of the New Testament. He was the guy that had done so many missionary trips, fun, starting and establishing churches everywhere. But when he wrote Philippians, he was still hungry. He was still a disciple. He never left that position. He still gave in to the things that matter. And he said, I have not yet attained to it yet. In San Jose this year, we find ourselves saying, Lord, when it comes to the things of God, make me hunger, make me desire more, let me know you more. May I live for the cause of God. This is the best way to celebrate our anniversary. Lastly, we started with this. Who is man that you take notice of him? Who is man that you just are so concerned about him? Can we pursue God the way He pursued us? Can we hunger for a relationship with Him the way that He hungered a relationship for you and me? Can you be personal to Him the way that He's personal to you? Because the truth is, God is after you. He loves you. And He's inviting you to have a real relationship with Him. Can we all stand up for a moment? Let's bow down our heads for a moment. Let's close our eyes. We're celebrating our 27th year. Can you just bow down your heads? Close your eyes. We talked about some things that are deep today. Can I ask you just talk to Him? Can you ask Him to just make Himself more real? Can you ask forgiveness? If you were not pursuing Him the way that He had pursued you, if you've shunned him away, put him aside, made him second priority, despite the fact that he had run after you, can you just, just talk to him? Lord, there are many things that I do not understand. There are many things that are too deep for me. I ask that you would be patient with me and make me understand how to relate with you how to be a child of God. Teach me to understand the meaning of why you sent your son to the cross. Help me to make the most of being a, an heir 
go air with Jesus Christ. So that I would really say deeply, Abba Father, I am a child of God. Lord, as we go through the grasp, I ask, Father God, that you would help me. Lord, to understand the need for me to lean in and to be a part of this church in building the community, the village, where people find you in faith and people find one another in love. We lift up to you the entire village as we celebrate our 27th year. And we ask, Lord, that you might make us a church. Lord, that will be what we are all meant to be for our time, for our era. Lord, we thank you. Maybe we can sing this song as a response to the message today.
much stature in my brother's eyes. I pray it said about my life that I live more to build your name than mine. It's a very beautiful song. Can we just hold the hands with one another as we end? Can you say to that person, happy 27th year anniversary? Let's pray. And Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for this series, How Is Your Grasp? We ask, Lord, that you would use it to strengthen our church life, our being part of the village that has blessed us, where we got to know you and know each other. Father, we ask that this month of April would be a, ye- uh, a month where we could deepen a relationship with you. Be with us at Soulergy. Starting tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we have our time of just understanding the different principles of prayer. Father, help us, Lord, to take time. Take time to just really be with you. Be with us in the summit as we gather as a church to just re- redirect to rejuvenate or just to recalibrate our hearts in you Father also be with us as we take up the first module of followers of Christ 101 that we might be established and rooted in the things of the faith Lord as we desire Lord God to get to know you more to get to know the things of God help us Father to be your disciples, to encourage one another to be disciples, to serve one another as we build the church where we get to be discipled and where we get to disciple others. We ask, Lord, that you might bless our tithes and our love offerings as part of our worship today as we ask you, Lord, meet the needs of the work. As we ask you, Lord, make us faithful, generous givers, As we ask you, Lord, teach us to live in the realm of eternal's kingdom. Father, we thank you for today, and we will be careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.